All right, so why don't you um, introduce yourself and a little bit about your background. Okay, very good. My name is Gola Wolf Richards, and uh, about my background, I have a degree in history of religions. I have an undergraduate degree in human development, which is a psychology area. I worked for maybe around 40 years in social work background, directing schools, working directly with individuals, a variety of experiences in social work. Um, I've written a book called The Way to See Whole. I'm um, entirely committed to um, conflict resolution, um, practically speaking, and the philosophy necessary in order to make that practicality come about. My chief partner's name is Dr. Christopher Hunt, and we've been collaborating for a number of years on the, this project of how to teach, uh, how to prepare right, to teach, now we're ready to do that sort of thing, conflict resolution. Um, we have broadcast capacities from our website at mottocitizens.com. That's M-O-T-T-O citizens.com. And we have our, the intention there is to have several modalities whereby people can come in and study thoughts uh, that would orient them to creating their best behavior. So that's it. So what is the, the key to uh, resolving conflict? Understanding, right, is necessary. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Um, when I uh, ask the question, I'm going to be cutting out my my question. So mm -hmm. uh, when you answer, if you could um, start in a full sentence. As oh. if... So you want to say the key to understanding conflict okay. is... Okay, gotcha. The key to understanding conflict is to put it within its largest context. Unfortunately, what we have um, ordinarily in history is that people will have their conflicts and they'll see them in a very limited way. It's me versus you. It's that type of person versus this type of person. Very limited. You have to go all the way back to the universe itself in order to understand how our conflict has derived from contrast and conflict in the universe itself, pre-human. We inherit our tendencies from the universe. In the universe, you will find contrast. Simply put, we could say up, down, left, right, uh, chaotic, cosmic. But they work together right in the universe. The larger cosmic context handles the chaotic tendencies. That tendency for human beings, right, the chaotic aspect of it, works out in terms of narrow perspectives, limited perspectives those would definitely engender chaotic circumstance. Childlike thinking, like an infant. Sweet, innocent, but doesn't know that the fact that it has limits to its context, predicated on its emotions and impulsivity, can't see how to wisely integrate itself into the larger context. Consequently, in growing up, one could say that maturity would mean that you drop the infantile limits to how you see and learn how to integrate yourself into the largest context. So the key for resolving war would have to do with instructing people in how to gain that largest perspective on the context, largest context, for conflict and how it's to be resolved. As one would gain a larger perspective, that would play a role in the resolution itself. Another piece would be the methodology. Since we're in a crisis, you want to go as fast as you can toward getting the largest number of people that you can to have a larger, more global, conflict-resolving perspective. That's very hard to do if you were going to try to do ordinary education, so I'm going to give someone experience and have them to study these hundred books and read these uh, essays and read this and listen to these people it would be relatively impossible to do. So it's important to have condensed pieces of information that people can study that have symbolic implications that are larger than the small bit of information itself, uh, using a few words to say a lot about human nature. So aphorisms, wise sayings, in other words, have been used throughout history to help people gain large purviews about generalized issues uh, no matter how specific 
the issue might be, they can find the general principles that would apply. So I'd say, using aphorisms, wise sayings, in an education process that equips an individual with being, uh, the capacity to see how history all together right, is reflected, the universe, how its conflict and conflict res resolving tendencies are involved in our personalities. Yeah, um, yeah, let me just pause for a second and focus. All right, well, let me just, let me just pick up for where sure. you were at and say, mm -hmm. um, what are some of these wise sayings that um, you were talking about the, to kind of encapsulate uh, educating people on conflict? Mm -hmm. I think of one um, right away. Understanding the nature of change changes the nature of understanding. It's one that I wrote in the book uh, that I have on the website. It's a free download, by the way. Another wise saying right, uh, that people would be generally um, aware of, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Uh, another saying, this one from Martin Buber, difficulties aren't hurdles on the road to God. Difficulties are the road. Okay, let me just... Can you just go through those, uh, just again, just because of the, the sound, um, mm -hmm. since that's now stopped. So. Yeah. One saying that I um, enjoy very much, I wrote it, is understanding the nature of change changes the nature of understanding. Another one that I'm fond of, um, it occurs in an essay that I wrote, is never hold growth hostage to how you believe, but learn to believe such that growth is ensured. Those sorts of things. So talk about um, uh, beliefs in a way that people hold on to beliefs and not, are not willing to change, and what happens when people aren't willing to change their beliefs okay. when the facts change. You can't have a thought without some degree of passion attached to it. And let me give you a little formula. In life, we know that if cold, right, is what is ascending, then the heat is descending. If light is what is commanding in the environment, then darkness, right, is not apparent. If darkness is commanding in the environment, then light is not apparent. When it comes to human psychology, it works this way. When emotions are high, logic tends to be low. When emotions are high, logic tends to be low. Therefore, when it comes to any kind of belief that we have, because we invest such strong feeling in those beliefs, it's not wrong that we should invest such strong feeling, but we need to have just as much logical force to guide those feelings so that we don't have a situation wherein, like a child, we have emotions or impulses riding dominant over our judgment. So in the history of religions, we have much, much passion. The history of politics, nationality, race. We have high passions, emotion high and logic low as a standard. We don't perceive it to be lacking in logic because in that condition, what's conferred is the mind of a child where we have the passions high, the emotion is low, the kid does not know that it's in danger in the road with playing ball, but nonetheless, the mind that is not in that state, the mind of the parent that has high passion and high logic, says, get out of the road. It's not a place to play. So the history of religions, unfortunately, also brings forth the custom of have high passion here, which can narrow the perspective. That's dangerous. Now we have a situation where we have to have high passion about the fact that all these ver variety of conflicts exist. Well, if I care about them all, then I have to have enough logic to understand every one of them in terms of how they connect. The way they connect is in human perception itself. So do you think that because there is a lot of passion with the religion that it blocked a lot of logic in uh, the current state of world affairs right now? It does indeed. It does indeed. And it does block. Okay, um, so mm -hmm. just... Yes. 
the high passion in religion, the high passion in anything um, that we might um, experience, right, has that tendency to block logic, logical processes. The two are not uh, antithetical, though. When we talk about maturity, it means, yes, in fact, you have very high passion about things. A mature person must care and care deeply. But you are also mindful of the excesses of that passion, right, the potential excesses. So therefore, you use the love. You use the anger, if you would, right? But you have to leaven it, right, consequently, right, with enough logic to not let it spill over into something that would be quite mistaken. So did you want to say You can see how did that play out? Right. In the, in the build-up to the war in Iraq, how did, um, how did you see the, that conflict and how it could have been solved in other means? Okay. I like to think that with regard to the build-up to the war in Iraq, it provides us with an opportunity to understand the build-up to war at all, right, historically. I have a sympathy with war. I want it gone, but I sympathize with its roots. By means of habit, it would make more sense that we fight because it's a custom that we fight, that we see to fight, we think to fight. It's our habit. We have not yet cultivated a habit that would be the antithesis of that. How do we live for peace? That is not what we do. The other thing is this. If you are distracted, or if you're not paying attention to a particular thing, then you will not confer much intelligence to that thing. It will not grow by means of your kind attention. Since most of our time is distracted time, it's deflected time. It's self-involved, self-indulgent time. It's immature time. It makes perfect sense that when the issues that could bring us to war arise, as they're all over the place, that we're ill-prepared to think in a way that would mean they would be alleviated. By anticipating war, the tendencies to war in consciousness, by anticipating them, then one would understand that we need to then study those tendencies to war that exist in every human consciousness as the only way to be prepared for reducing and ultimately getting rid of war. It's self-management, self-cultivation, acknowledging the tendency to chaos that exists in all of us. It doesn't occur directly. Most people don't find themselves getting up in the morning and intending to hurt someone. Yet it would also be true that most people get up in the morning without knowing it with limits to their consciousness that could, in the right circumstance, put them at odds with someone. The person who is a racist doesn't generally wake up right, with the hatred in their mind. Introduce them to the circumstance that could cause that, right, and there the hatred is because they're ill-prepared. So I'd say that Iraq is not unique Iraq makes sense in terms of, sadly, right, it makes sense in terms of the history of our customs. We fight. Our custom is not to study how not to fight. That is not what we do. We worship beautiful ideas, love thy neighbor as thyself. We do not practice beautiful ideas. We do not study to make that become a custom. That's one of the problems, I'd say, with religion, right, is its old custom is worship as opposed to behave in a new way. So you see that there's a uh, hypocrisy in a way that there may be uh, nonviolent teachings within the Bible and teachings of Christ, but then the behavior, there's a disconnect there? Did... For myself, I wouldn't use the word hypocrisy in talking about the um, disconnect between love thy neighbor as thyself and religions, right, and the fact that we don't do that. I wouldn't call it hypocrisy. I see it as a, re a matter of innocence. Um, our history, to my mind, is young. Human beings as a species, we're young. So in terms of the youth of our development, I have a sympathy with the fact that we haven't sobered up enough to make the connection between how we feel, how we subjectively identify, and what we objectively do as a custom. So no, I would not attack the religious traditions in saying that they're hypocritical. 
I would say for someone like myself though, right, with this information, if I didn't act on this information, I would be hypocritical. I wouldn't say about any soldier out there who's fighting that that person is hypocritical if they're also religious. I'd say just the opposite, that more likely than not, they're being honorable based upon what they believe, how they understand things. They have not been introduced to a more sophisticated, a better rounded education with regard to managing human nature. So for the kid who's fighting a war right now, I'd be in no position to damn them for fighting out of honor if I and the others of us that are mature haven't prepared them for reducing war through better human understanding. That would not be their fault, it would be mine. So if the United States is the most powerful country, it's got the, most, the biggest army, and we've done a lot of preparation for war, we think about war a lot, we spend a lot of our budget on it, mm -hmm. and we as humans can't really, haven't come up with a way to approach war, or religion has been historically um, used in wars. For us, this Iraq war was the terrorist attack on the name of Allah, and then, you know, George Bush cites Jesus as his um, favorite. favorite philosopher. And so mm -hmm. people always seem to have God on their side of war, but we haven't mm -hmm. figured out how to actually stop the process. Then there's Gandhi, who came up with nonviolence. But um, what kind of suggestions would you have for, if there's not a vision yet, for a society to start thinking or creating some other kind of solutions to the next evolution? Mm -hmm. um, just, let me... Just took it this way. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, not yeah. Me. <laughs> very sorry. Okay, good. Um, you um, ask a complex question, let me give a complex answer to that. The first part, I have a huge sympathy with, huge sympathy, with all the preparation for war. I sympathize with it because the imperative has been, our habit has been that we've been warring people. So consequently, it would be only practical to expect that if I might be attacked, I should be prepared for that. So war preparations, to my mind, make logical sense in terms of our history. The issue is, do we uh, want to change that history? And given the fact that I'll assume that we do want to change that history, how do we back off from the fact that the habits around the world for people being warring, warring people, are still there? How do we back off from our uh, perceived need for all the machinery of war when we don't see any unified way whereby everybody in the world is suddenly going to stop being warring? Follow? That's an interesting supposition. The attitude is to start right somewhere that would be very safe. First would be, not necessarily do you put your stick down, but you pick up the proper books, if you would. In other words, while you're holding the stick, you must also understand that it's no longer a means for preventing global death. And if I am now going to prepare for the next war, I have to see that the way I have to eradicate it is in myself. So I have to prepare a generalized education for human nature that undercuts all the traditional ways whereby people are divided. In other words, it has to undercut the history of conflict vis-a-vis -vis religion. It has to undercut the history of conflict vis-a-vis -vis strong versus weak. It has to undercut every category. So, then it's an education about the nature of human perception, if you would. How is it that perception operates? And this is what we try to teach from our website and the materials there. How is it that perception operates? such that you can draw everyone into a context where they can see themselves and say, oh yes, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Only by means of identifying with how consciousness operates, for good and for bad, can we have trust. So that then you don't, uh, you're less able to say to somebody else, you are the locus of evil, right? I'm the locus of good. Everyone would be able to see the good and the evil within themselves and see the dangers that are involved in any of their overdone identities in terms of nationality, religion, uh, position, if you would. So in other words, there's, uh, what seems to be happening is that Americans see themselves as good 
and the enemies are evil, and so they must go kill evil. Uh, is that how you see it? Or? Um, I don't see it simply as Americans seeing, um, as Americans, us seeing ourselves as good and other people as evil. I would say the experience of good and evil happens in many more minute circumstances than that. If you're at home and there's a wife being beaten by a husband, right, she would see him as evil and herself as the victim, right, in that circumstance and in that sense, the good. It's all over the place. We have to understand that contrast is necessarily going to exist, up, down, left, right, good and evil. You have to pull it inside if you're going to change and say that that tendency to have my emotions get so high that my logic gets low, that's what's evil, if you would. It's something that I'll have sympathy with at a certain stage. In every baby, every child, I'll have sympathy with it. In the history of the world, I have sympathy with it as an historical feature. But now in terms of moving forward, I can't maintain a sympathy with it where it would mean I'm indulgent of myself and not responsible for learning that now I have to be personally responsible for monitoring emotion high, logic low tendencies in my personality. The reason I say emotion high, logic low is because it pairs with what happens in the universe entire. Up, down, left, right, old, young, right, um, now, then, it's the, the basic duality, yin, yang, uh, cosmos, chaos, urum, thurum. It's uh, the basic thing all over the place, male, female. Works in our psychology that way. So now the education has to be, move away from nationalism. Our history in terms of groups makes perfect sense. None of us would have survived were it not for the tribes. We would never have made it. We wouldn't literally have survived history. But now we're needing a much larger context so that the, the um, involvement has to be the individual and the global. Every individual is certainly going to pass through limited stages of development. Me and my family. Me and my family's religion. Me and my family's race and religion. Me and my family's politics, race and religion. Those sorts of stages. Those have to be dropped for an individual having a relationship to all of history. So it has to be the individual and the global. That has to be the ultimate context. How do I affect world development by means of my cultivation of self? Okay, so um, do you see that, um, what, what do you see in human nature over history that has a desire to to see war or to see violence. Why is it if we have a, a capitalist media and when violent shows are shown on television, there's a high viewership? What is it that draws us towards viewing violence? Mm -hmm. I really don't see it as the, the issue as we are drawn to seeing violence. I think a larger uh, category is that we're drawn to excitement and that violence is one mode of excitement. Uh, larger than violence, right, sex, we're drawn to excitement. There'd be more people that would turn on um, sex shows, if you give them a choice, than they would the battles between this soldier and that soldier. People enjoy excitement. Your chance to be a millionaire, large membership in the audience, people like excitement around the idea. The other is that given the general state of human development, and this is said sympathetically, because we are so young, you would find high infantile tendencies so that we're always protecting our children from going from exciting things. Children would reach for fire because the bright light excites them. It would burn them. It's not that they go to be burned. They don't understand that they are going to be burned thereby. People have excitement with war because the hero right, in war has played a very important role in the salvation of the tribe and the group right, uh, heretofore. So heroism, preparation for dealing with protecting your group, that's where you'll find that hero over there in the war story. That model now has to change. So 
Hence that saying, understanding the nature of change changes the nature of understanding. We're now at an apogee point, Greek term, right, where we've reached the point where the full moon, right, has to turn into the new moon, the new moon turns into the full moon. We're at a point in history where, and this is a wonderful thing, we have to say it's now time for us to not indulge ourselves further in thinking that life is simply an issue we'd like, where we're born, we live, we get stuff, and we die. We're now at a time where we have to think in order to survive. Plato's idea of us being um, philosopher kings, if you would, um, the same sort of thing you'd find throughout the history of religion and philosophy, celebrated religion and philosophy, is that at some point or another, if you do not become sagely or move towards sagely thought, right, you will die consequent to your immaturity. So it's a kind of evolution? It's evolution. Evolution to the point where instead of fighting with our fists, we need to be able to think with our brains? It's evolution. And there's really nobody to blame, right, except ourselves, right, taking on responsibility, not even blame there. I can only blame you for what you understand. The reason why we have such sympathy with retardation and the behaviors that come from people being retarded is because they don't understand. The same would be true in terms of habits, where we understand that somebody could understand, but they're other lot wise waylaid by addiction. We pardon the addict for acting in a way that the addiction compelled. Our customs are compelling. So consequently, I have a huge sympathy with the fact that we fight. This is the human family that I love, but my human family fights, predicated on habits. By sympathetically understanding habits, I don't have to be angry with anybody. I also, by understanding history, don't have to look to see who's more bloody than anybody else. They're all bloody. Everybody's bloody. If we like the opportunities that we have nowadays for us in the West in particular, Somebody was mercilessly killed, right, to have the land that we have. I don't blame my forebearers for that. I have sympathy with the ignorance. I would blame myself in further going, right, if I committed the same thing. Looking back, I have more sympathy what, uh, with uh, what, for me, looking forward, would be an atrocity. I have the capacity to understand humans being subject to compelling features. I have the responsibility for handling those compelling tendencies in my personality. I have the capacity to understand that enemy versus friend, right, is the old paradigm. My responsibility is to understand that that paradigm no longer can be carried forward, except I want to destroy the world. Okay. Did you? Okay. The um, so it seems like. Um, my production company is Metafoc Productions, which is thinking about thinking, which mm -hmm. seems to be what you seem to be also saying that, that if we just being aware of how we are processing information and aware how change happens, then that seems to be a key that will break the cycle of just repeating all of our former habits of, of resort, or use, using our fist instead of our brain to resolve the conflict. Mm -hmm. um, do you see what? What do you see as um, the best way to educate people mm -hmm. on on what you what what you seem to have uh, uh, discovered through all your research? So, how do, what to do from this point, given yeah. this piece of information? I've been very blessed. I've had the um, very very good fortune to have friends who've become partners with me in creating MottoCitizens.com. They uh, have in place a um, tremendous amount of trust in my ability to summarize history, the history of how human development occurs, and I put that in several different modalities. I wrote a book called The Way to See Whole. So with regard to how do we go forward, it's a book for contemplation over and over, thoughts to be reviewed over and over and over. I did my best to make it seductive in making it a small book. 
It won't take long for a person to understand, though, though it's small, it covers history entirely. Entirely. Consequently, by using contemplation, repeated like choreography, a person gets a chance to understand better and develop a habit, if you would, a new custom right, for how to perceive conflict. So that's one modality. The other is in our website, we have lots of very folksy, homey, um, sit by the fireside, if you would, folk wisdom that's made in a way that's beautiful to hear, uh, music, softness, but depth. So I scoured um, tremendous amounts of homey literature and extracted statements that could be used like small stories and present them in formats so that people can listen to four minutes, half hour, right, or many hours of uh, information that they then can repeat. They can listen to one sentence. The book was written so that simple thoughts would be contemplated. We have an oracle, if you would, in the website, so that even for a question that someone would want to put, these fights that are going on in the world right now, how should I think about that? Then they get a one-line response to contemplate from the book that comes up. So. The, uh, I've been blessed with the time to write about what I understand and what I love. And I love humanity. I have a sympathy for conflict. I have an absolute sympathy for conflict. So I do not go out and uh, say that the warrior makes no sense to me. The warrior makes total sense to me. The responsibility is not so much on the warrior but on the educator. That the warrior needs to have, many times, their valor honored by those of us who have the chance to study, present something so that they can put their guns down. And how do you, how do you see that, um, you know, from what I've seen of uh, Joseph Campbell talking about myths and uh, over uh, myths in a way that kind of uh, encapsulate human desires in a way, or, or, you know, hero myth, or the, um, in a way that's what people are attracted to, this ex excitement or this um, uh, arousement of, of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so how do, you, how do you extrapolate that? When you look at the news media, how does the media take those elements of entertainment and, and exploit them mm -hmm. um, when they do their stories? Yeah. The, um to my mind, the truth is that it has to do with stages of development. Many of the heroes in popular um, movies, um, books, are not my heroes. They would perhaps have been my heroes at a certain stage of development, but not at this stage of development. So in the commercial business of uh, entertainment, Popularity is extremely important. So therefore, you go for what the average level of development is. It isn't so much that you see the media controlling what people think, but pandering to what people think, what people would like to think. So therefore, if you get the populace to mature, then the media will follow. If you get the populace to mature, then the politicians will get a chance to grow up. The politician is voted in, therefore they must be popular. They'll say whatever they think the average person is apt to think. Consequently, we have a situation wherein it isn't fair for us to criticize the politician without giving them room right, to legislate in different directions. If we were more mature, they'd be saying, save the earth right away and let's take action. <laughs> but because they understand that though we can feel save the earth, but we'd rather hold on to our F SUV, <laughs> their energies will be given to save the SUV at the expense of the earth because that's the only way I remain in power. So you, in other words, you see the, the stage of development of the 
average American as being, in a way, immature, um, such that, you know, and if that's the case, what, what do we do? Yeah. I wouldn't go so far as to say, in any harsh fashion, that the average state of an American is to be immature. I would go to say that the average state of earthly development, in terms of humanity, right, is less mature than it needs to be, far less mature than it needs to be. In fact, I would congratulate a tremendous amount of what I see in America, right, as evidence of profound maturity. In our country, we have seen things happen quickly that have never happened in history before. The integration of the races, you don't find that sort of thing as broadly done as in the United States. The abolition right, of sexual differences, right, um, preferences, it's happening very quickly in the United States. That's not true all over the world. So in that sense, it's not so much America, too, that um, is exampling this big change. It's how America examples the change its potential in humanity. To my mind, America still is humanity's experience. And we are, in fact, a growth tip that shows what humanity is all about, good and bad. So, it would be true about many, 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 many generations all over the world that they have been limited by their customs. Americans can be limited by customs. But our potential to become available to change, extraordinary. One in terms of technology. If, in fact, people were interested in reading the Encyclopedia Britannica all day long, CBS, ABC, any other kind of um, organization you could put together would have it completely filled, right, with information from the encyclopedia. It has to do with the state of development of the people. So we note one thing then. If, in fact, we note that we can concretize immaturity, that every piece of information, newspaper, television, radio, has to be considered education, not simply in terms of its content, but as, its, as a modality, that it is a mode of education, education. If we understand that right away, that has to become a part of the public dialogue. That has to become a part of uh, homeland protection. That has to become a part of the political dialogue that we're not exampling the maturity that's going to be necessary for the organization necessary, one, to save the planet, and also to reduce the enmity that exists in the world. If that's not a part of the public dialogue, then those of us who are in positions to say, to speak, are remiss. So, in, in terms of conflict resolution, do you, what do you see the role of uh, understanding and then acknowledging the differences and, in a way, agreeing to disagree as opposed to not willing to even engage at all and just, um, in a way, dehumanize each other. Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely believe in evolution. So that um, my attitude, I'm not thwarted by the fact that disagreements are out there. I'm more concerned about the aggregation of uh, force among those people who can see most deeply, act most um, completely in the interest of character development. I do believe that in the simplicity of the hundredth monkey idea, if you're familiar with that, where after a time, if you get enough people behaving in a certain way, then you get the change you need. First a few to lead the many. I believe that in terms of um, adaptation, as Darwin did show, that Truly speaking, the most adapted personality to human nature is the mature personality. It shows tremendous virtue. It adapts well, takes care of people within its context well. So maturity is the most adaptive force. So my interest is not, I'm not so frightened of the crazy stuff that's going on as I am looking desperately to um, increase aggregate, organize those strong tendencies of maturity that have brought us through thousands and thousands of years. So what, what role do you see an institution like the United Nations to play in 
in that, that resolve? Again, if the United Nations has to babysit, right, um, United Nations of immaturity, right, that's too much to ask. If any nation, if any individual has to be babysitting immaturity, uh, that's too much to ask. So when I look at the United Nations, to my mind, right, I love the idea right, of people working together. But you have to identify the central thing that people have to work to do. We do not have, as of yet, a well-identified notion of what constitutes mature human behavior. How does it look? And that becomes the goal. Not in terms of nations, in terms of individuals. United Nations needs to be replaced, if you would, conceptually with the idea of global citizens. It's citizens identifying what they need to do, what we need to do as individuals to make our interface with one another in the planet, right, smooth. What do we need to do? Now we've developed a conventional idea that the nations and the leaders of the nations, right, have to direct all of the changes. That's impossible. When you have a huge, if you've ever taught school or any, any teachers out there would know, if you don't have students that are prepared to be um, disciplined in the classroom, if it's all unruly students in the classroom, there won't be much teaching done. So consequently, the issue has to be turned back on the individuals. The questions have to be put. If I have cultural standards, that keep me from seeing my individual responsibility for being a global citizen, I have to register, if you would, first with myself. How am I going about changing that? To my mind, it's education. What are you doing as an individual to make yourself a bona fide global citizen? Well, I wanted to uh, kind of encapsulate that idea because I think it's an, an important mm -hmm. perception of the United Nations, and could you uh, connect for me uh, the immaturity and then the United Nations of trying to, the impossibility of the United Nations trying to corral immaturity and uh, the importance of global citizenship. Why do we need to be global citizens? What's, what's the problem with just only worrying about, you know, making, accumulating all the stuff um, in my own, in, in our own lives, in other words, not worrying about the, the costs of, of the capitalist or the consumeristic ways and not seeing the benefits. All right. I had let you know earlier on that um, all of our tendencies are, come from the universe itself. And so the model is the universe. So if I want to look to how interaction should be done, quite fine for me to look at a good old Mother Earth and see how interaction amid multiplicity, how it should be done. If I want to see interaction amid diversity, right, look at Mother Earth and I'll see interaction amid diversity, right, to see how it's done. So when coming to the United Nations, I would have to understand that the first rule that we would want to understand is reciprocity. That I do not exist in a world where my behavior goes without consequence. If I understand reciprocity, right, that there is no possibility to escape that, I have an effect on history, immediate and foregoing. I have an effect on the meaning of the future. I actually, in fact, can change the meaning of the past. A hardship can become a victory for me if I know how to grow uh, by means of it. So consequently, the United Nations, to my mind, right, needs to be uh, relieved, ultimately, of a lot of the work that it does do, consequent to the absence of, absence of character development on the part of global citizens. So much sharing that could be easily done without massive organization simply isn't done because for the majority of the world that has money, the truth is, too, out of sight, out of mind, right, is the rule that we largely follow with regard to other people's needs. Animals, plants, out of sight, out of mind. 
I don't think about it. If I have to have an organization then come to substitute for my immaturity, for my indulgence, indulgence becomes a habit that's hard to fight with and my perception gets altered and I think you're wanting too much from me when you're begging for my 2% charity. You're asking for too much. I might have to give up my SUV. <laughs> so how do you resolve being a global citizen with our, our system of capitalism? I think that the resolving of global citizenship or with capitalism has to uh, take account of change. Things come into existence. The issue is, are they timely? Things will go out of existence. You want it to be on a timely basis. So without attempting to do damage to the um, values that capitalism has brought about, we would also have to be aware of the fact that it's not something that is to persist forever. That it brought in, has brought about, tremendous technological change. Tremendous technological change. But it's also brought about some of the most irresponsible way of making money you could imagine. I want those stocks. I don't know how the money was made. I just want the money. Usury as it used to be called, right? So there's some dangerous, dangerous disconnects between how we have our wealth and our understanding for how the wealth is developed. It's not so much that capitalism or in and of itself is a problem. It's that no one's being a steward over how our economics right, have impact on the planet. If I have green stocks, very healthy, promoting women's rights, promoting the safety right, of the animal world, give me more. If the capital that I want is not simply in terms of surfeit, but I want capital meaning I want opportunities developed for people's humanity, give me more of that particular type of stock. Okay. Are you getting me tired? Oh, no, I'm fine, I think. Um, well, what I notice is that you have a very, when you talk about conflicts, you have a very big vision of society. And you step back as far as to the universe and to evolution. And, um, well, the United States has traditionally been Christian, mm -hmm. and there's a belief in the afterlife of, not quite an afterlife, but of heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. And then in the East, there's a lot more of a belief in reincarnation. And I personally think that people's view of death and their purpose for being here is going to have a huge impact on how they view conflict. Um, and so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, like how their perception of their mortality affects the way that they would view conflict with one another. Yes. Because, I mean, I would, mm -hmm. it, your sounds to be more of a reincarnation view, that you see things from such a far away back than is in, but, but I'm just wondering, so. Mm -hmm. Do you want to no, something? I just want to get to Oh, so sorry. Okay. Um, concerning symbols in religion, heaven, hell, terminology, um, rebirth, those are beliefs that people hold. And the symbols themselves can be interpreted otherwise. We have to remember that what we inherit right, are customs of belief. No child that's born right, comes out complete with uh, defined beliefs about heaven, hell, rebirth, judgment day. That's something taught. Everyone that holds such a thought was taught such a thought and they hold it and remember they are taught to believe it with great passion, which psychologically could mean then passion high, emotion high, logic could be very low around those subjects. I like to make symbols functional. So therefore, if I have a symbol for good human behavior, ideal human behavior, I call that heaven. It would have to mean then, I'd enrich it some with saying all of those ideas that make for order to be beautiful order, humane order, over the opposite tendency, inhumane order, that would be heavenly. 
If I have a concept of hell, it would be just the opposite. That world that comes into being when I do not behave in a heavenly fashion. Life after death. One thing that's very obvious is that based on change, we are the evidence of life after death. There was a before. All right? We are here now. We are life after death. Have we made life after all the death that's preceded us? All right? Heavenly or hellish? It's up to us. <laughs> so I do not try to impose understanding beyond the limits of what conception can do. I can't, no matter how much faith I have, project myself into a fantasy. So I can't walk around any throne based upon my faith, nor am I running from any pitchfork, right, based upon my fear. I am in fact, though, capable of creating heavenly or hellish circumstances right now as evidence of how I am translating the history that went on before, the life that existed before in humanity, and me, as life after death, I'm determining whether it's hellish or heavenly. The passion has to be shifted toward not so much what you believe about what could be in the uh, fantastic sense of after death, but what you do, in fact, all right, in the phenomenal sense, of with life that you are capable of affecting. Do you bring the heavenly to the present centered or the hellish? So in terms of the history of religions, worship and all of the particular thoughts that I call religiosity are habits. I will make this behavior or that behavior and this is the way I bow and this is how much incense I light and these are how many candles I light and this is um, a saint and that's not a saint. All of those ideas, if they support me in behaving well, then use every one of those rituals, right, to behave well. The real litmus test has to be how do you come out and behave, right, in the real world, right? Do you simply worship the heavenly or do you enact heavenly behaviors, meaning you come out into the global environment and perform in terms of ethical units, Right? that anyone who doesn't have your faith would understand. Right? Kindness is understandable by people, whether they have Buddhist, Christian, right? um, anyone. The thirsty person right, drinks water. They don't need to drink your faith. They understand your kindness in terms of the water that you gave them. So practical behaviors have to become paramount in, understand, in defining right, religious sincerity. Right now, ritual behaviors and fantasy thoughts define someone. The weight is in the wrong direction. And uh, how have you seen um, the Bush administration in particular use passion to uh, manipulate beliefs to achieve their goals? I wish that the president was original. Uh, he is not. President Bush is repeating an old formula. And I'm not trying to say that he's repeating the old formula out of any kind of, um, um, or rather I'll turn it around and say, not in any way that's any more ugly than a number of people. If we're doing something very important, we love to have, we want to have as many people as possible to back us up. So therefore, if you can mention apple pie, if you can mention religion, if you can mention mom, right, whatever you can throw out there, God, whatever you can throw out there that has the historical allegiance of the people, people will throw out right, in a political situation. The unfortunate truth is, too, with regard to President Bush, right, his purview, we do not elect people to be leaders of nations anywhere in the world that I know of because of their wisdom not generalized wisdom anyway. They're elected because of popularity, which has to do with what they said, not necessarily what they do. So consequently, President Bush, in his position as a leader of this nation, and therefore the most uh, effective person, not positively effective, 
uh, positively affected person in terms of the globe, right? He comes to us with his traditions. And in his tradition, there would be the old fashioned good versus evil, which is external. What I'm suggesting is that it has to be focused on human nature itself. And faith is not a substitute for good behavior. Faith is not a substitute for ethics. Faith in and of itself is not ethical. We can see that because we don't find the terrorist who has a faith to be ethical. We think that person's out of their mind. Yet they are pronouncing with sincerity faith. Faith doesn't make you safe from being unethical. So the judgments about ethicality right, are quite, quite different. Power, too. If you're the President of the United States, there's a tremendous availability for seduction to power. There's also the, based on general human nature, an understanding of perhaps it couldn't get better than this. In fact, it could. Safety from war is better than this. Safety from ignorance is better than this. Safety from um, a lack of comfortable neighborhoods is better than this. How to get there right, can never be achieved simply by means of sound bites and money. It has to be through the elevation of character. So if a person believes that character is elevated simply by means of faith, that if I identify with the club, right, I've joined this particular religious group, and by means of my identity there, then I have elevated character because now in God's eyes, I am a good person. That belief as a habit has been passed on for thousands and thousands of years. Now we have to examine it and say, isn't it better for me to see that if in fact I'm going to represent the godly, at the very least, the cosmos is what I have to contain. I have to be global if I'm going to represent the godly. I have to understand the nature of contrast if I'm going to represent the godly. I have to bring contrast into harmonious relationship if I'm going to represent the godly. The old Greek term, the demigod, I'm a little god, that's our responsibility. To imitate the order of the cosmos is our responsibility. We can get away with, a politician can get away with not having to do that if the populace isn't prepared to do that. So, so long as general populations around the world do not see their responsibility for global personalities, for global change, then politicians won't be required to do any more than represent our um, immature tendencies. I mean, how do you see the uh, media play into this equation of uh, how they're performing and, and uh, serving our democracy? Yeah. I see the, the media as being um, a reflection of the general populace. Okay, can you just uh, say that again? I see the media as being a reflection of the general populace. They give us what we want, right? They give, us, they give the average desire. It makes them safe in terms of making money, and that's a guarantee. If they're making money, right, they're meeting somebody's need, if you would, somebody's desires being met. So it's very safe for the media, right, to, they do not take many risks with regard to information. Consequently, in terms of the role, right, it's a habit building thing. It's like smoking a cigarette. Same question could be put this way. What does one more cigarette do for the person who has a cigarette habit? It increases their habit. What does one more shot of heroin do for the person who has a heroin habit? It increases their habit. That's what happens with the media. One more shot of average increases our tendency to be average at a time when beyond average is needed. Okay, can you, um, I think I had a, a bus um, in the back. Can you just repeat with the uh, one more shot of apparent increase, the, the habit? Just one more shot of the average. Of the yeah. average. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 just do all well, just the, um, you know, the cigarette analogy with the, the media analogy. Just because, of, sound bite. <laughs> because of, the, oh, oh, oh. Uh, cause of the, um, the, the noise in the background. Okay, good. Um, okay, I'm just sticking off. 
to be very aware of all the well, that's good that you're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. um, with regard to the media, I'd like to make an analogy um, to any form of habit. I do think that um, we find ourselves, our general tendencies, reflected in the media. It's us that we see there. Our average desires, no matter how much we might complain about it, it is so successful because the people use it. Consequently, if we see this as a dangerous situation, think of a cigarette habit. That someone uses a cigarette over and over again is not because it's good for them, it's because they're addicted to it. That someone shoots up heroin over and over again is not because it's good for them, it's because they're addicted to it. We hear regularly the criticisms about the poor state of the media. We hear the garbage, the rot, the um, drivel. We hear it. Yet we don't let go because we're addicted to it. So consequently, in terms of the responsibility of the people, we must wean ourselves away from the average media. In the same way that we have to wean ourselves away from cigarettes, heroin, or whatever else it would be. We have detox programs, right, for uh, addictions. We must understand that our average state of culture, it is in terms of its maturity, its value for our social relations, its value for uh, allowing us time to think more deep, deeply than what we do so that we become something other than specialists at being shallow. We have to, in fact, detox the Unplug the television isn't necessarily the answer. Change the channel to something that is more deserving of your attention. That's hard for people to do, yet it has to be addressed as an addiction. We don't look at the consequences. We think that to be simply entertained right, is an all right result. We do know the consequences of smoking, right, to simply have pleasure, with regard to smoking, is not an okay result because there's cancer that comes about. We know heroin or anything else that might cause a sense of euphoria isn't okay because there is a, a, a host right, of difficulties that come about with health, including, of course, death. The investigation of teaching to understand that influence, anything that's entertaining is also influencing. So if we see the average state of um, what's on the TV, the radio, right, the records, right, as our primary education. This is what we're taught to think. This is our mind. Is it the mind that can be responsible for the raising of babies? Is it a mind that's going to give much attention to the issue of conflict resolution? Will it even take the time when it's so addicted to sitting there being involved with stupidity? Will it? If you develop too much of a taste for sugar, you may not want all the other things that would be good for you, the broccoli and the whatever else, right, that would be good for you. When you develop a taste for the absolute, absurdly easy to understand, the jocular, it's very hard for you to develop a taste for deeper thought. It's an addiction. So how, how do you see, um, you know, throughout history in the ancient, Greeks or Romans would use uh, debate as a form of education, and it seems now that we're getting further away from engaging in lengthy debates, and it has been reduced to the sound bites. So how do we go from where we're at now to the more, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what do you see uh, education as, or a debate as a form of education? Mm -hmm. um, when concerning, um, you mentioned the ancient Greeks, right, um, or any other ancient society, I really don't see that the majority of people in those circumstances would have been involved in serious debate. I really don't see that. Um, I think if you had television with the same sort of programming that we have now back then, we would have had uh, the same sort of conflicts. The issue is the order of magnitude has changed. So what I see now is that where they would never have had the potential to be as distracted by so much fluff. 
at such a critical time in history where the earth itself was prepared to fall, not simply uh, the uh, various Greek cities, but the entire planet right, is prepared to fall. It makes it a crisis of an entirely different order of magnitude. So for right now then, in terms of the information, our economy right now is totally dependent upon our juvenile tendencies. If you suddenly stop juvenility in our country, all of a sudden the money machine will go kaput. So it has to be a graduated understanding. First it has to be introduced. We must move to a more mature economy. It doesn't mean that we couldn't have um, plenty. I think we very much could have plenty with sustainable economy, sustainable growth, environment. We could have, but we have to plan to get there. Right now, without the planning, without making the uh, call to the people to say, this is where we've got to go, and this is how we need to get there, we would have catastrophe if you suddenly got up and said, everyone stop right, participating in this immature economy. All of a sudden, you'd find everything going kaput. No more this, no more that, kaput. Including your ability to talk to the people because all of the technology would shut down. So it has to be an announcement that we are moving to a higher stage of economic relations. It will look differently. There will be better health, safety, more to confer right, to the future, not less, more of health, more of wisdom, more of happiness, not necessarily more of stuff. There will be better pricing, if you would. I use that term loosely. Because so much of what things cost now doesn't represent um, what they could cost in a more mature society. So you would have to have an announcement, people understanding, this is where we're going to go. That's what you'd have to do. It's quite a large vision of, of seeing the big picture of what things could be and seeing that where we're at and then trying to, you know, I, I guess I try to bring it back down to, uh, you know, this particular film and how it, how it um, plays out and going to, to war in Iraq because of natural resources potentially mm -hmm. for oil. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do you see? Right, I'm just, um, so what do you do you see that um, going to war over natural resources mm -hmm. you know, do you see um, that this particular war was because of that mm -hmm. um, I would say yes that was involved uh, that going to war over natural resources here I'd say yes that was involved yet I want to say that again with tremendous sympathy Although the people, or generally speaking, don't pay much attention to it, the fun we have, the pleasures, the indulgences that we enjoy, are all linked to oil right now. So if you're going to be politically significant in this country, the last thing in the world you want to do is to not have control of the energy resources for the people. Changing over to other alternative energy resources, we have the wherewithal for doing that. But to get there in a smooth fashion would require alerting the people that the crisis is we must now become aware that we have to shift. And that in that process, there would be something to be for uh, some forbearance that you would have to um, expect. Do it. Do the big thing. Go big. Do it for your children. Do understand that if we persist, we're running out of resources and we're compelling fights over circumstances that we could otherwise avoid through planning. Do the big thing. Do the moral thing. Tell the truth. We know we can't wait for politicians 
to tell the truth if the politician figures you don't want to hear the truth. I'm going to tell you they won't be elected. Uh, you're going to have to do without such and such. Ah, boop, turn him off. Turn her off. I'm not interested. I want to hear the person that's telling me you don't have to give up anything and I'm going to give you some more. Only because of our own immaturity then do we get hooked into a situation that compels the war. The very people that love their children, I'm one of them, we all are, people love their kids, do not understand, don't see the connection between putting our children on the front line in terms of war, unnecessarily, based on the fact that we're not collectively involved in planning for an economy that doesn't need those resources. To have any child die for those resources when we could plan otherwise, that's a shame. It's not the same as having someone die, right, for the rights of other people, right, to uh, not be enslaved. There's no honor in that. If, in fact, laziness, don't bother me, I'm comfortable, is the real baseline reason for me promoting circumstances than to have these lovely, wonderful kids, brave, wonderful children out there fighting to be killed and to kill others simply because the at-home population decided that thinking is beneath me. Planning is something that I don't do. I don't do that. That's reprehensible. What do you see? Okay. What is your, uh, your perspective on weapons of mass destruction or using nuclear deterrence on our end, but trying to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction with other people? How do you see that dynamic? And, mm -hmm. and well, yeah. I see that um, modern culture is a weapon of mass destruction, period. We're in an era where all human behavior can aggregate to being a weapon of mass destruction. Consequently, if we have environmental degradation to continue at the level that it is now, right, our habits of consumption are weapons of mass destruction. That's not a set of pretty words. That's the plain truth. So the average state of consumption by the American populace is a weapon of mass destruction with regard to the world. If it's true that we're arranging at about 6% of the world's population and consuming somewhere around 80-some percent of the world's resources, having the most enormous effect on global warming, our behaviors, our economic behaviors, our consumption constitutes the most dangerous weapon of mass destruction that's out there. So we're in an era where all unreviewed human behavior, the lack of cultivation of human behavior, insight into our, the impacts of our behavior, collectively speaking, is a weapon of mass destruction. It'll have different forms. We promote hatred of one another by means of not cultivating our understanding of human nature then therefore ignorance is a weapon of mass destruction. It promotes the, the terrorism, if you would. It promotes every other form right, of danger. Ignorance is the thing to be undermined. Okay, great. Do you have a... Yeah, that's good. Um, any other thoughts of uh, what to do in regards to terrorism? How, how we should treat that as a practical problem yeah. or issue? Terrorism compels understanding human nature. That's the proper retort. I do understand, practically speaking, if someone's going to be coming over the wall with a bomb, right, you find any other practical means, right, for stopping that individual. But truthfully speaking, the only way that we can abate terrorism, it's not like fighting a nation, right, at all anymore, is to abate generalized ignorance around the world. So therefore we have to have a global education for the elevation of human nature. That's what we offer from our website. Okay, great. Thanks. That was really good.